Welcome to Conducting Classroom-Based Research. This is um, one in a series of um, webinars planned by the National Tribal Watch Center to help you um, uh, improve your practice and be informed about the best in cybersecurity uh, cyber education. So, Diane, if you'll advance the slide, please. So I wanted to just to let you know if you can go back one. Oh, that wasn't one. Okay, that's me. Okay, that's me. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's me. I'm Portia Pusey. I'm the director of instructional media at the National Cyber Watch Center, and um, and I put these um, presentations together. So the first thing I always like to do is let you know what's coming up. Um, we, if you are a CAE or know someone who's a CAE and has to be designated this year, everyone has a lot of questions and the National Cyber Watch Center is here to help. So we have the last in our CAE webinar series. Um, if you would like to be included in that, please email me at Portia at the cyberwatchcenter.org. Um, and then also, um, our next webinar series of the series, which always occurs on the last Friday of the month at 11 o'clock, is a CCDC debrief. Um, we, um, we felt like um, the students and the coaches really wanted more information about what happened this year in the competition and what skills they could improve on, what was um, what what things what they could do to improve their teamwork and improve their score. So that will all be happening. Um, on April 28th this year, and there is a shortened URL on this slide. Um, after every webinar, we always send out the um, slide presentation, so if you didn't get this information, you can um, click on the slide presentation that you'll receive in your thank you, uh, thank you letter, and um, and you'll be able to click right into these um, uh, uh, registration links. So just to let you know, there's um, there's a lot more um, great webinars coming up. We have, um, and we're going to talk about um, building enrollment in your programs, um, what key skills industry is looking for. We have one plan on security clearances. We have a, um, we have one on the student association. We have one on the um, national cyber league, and all of those are coming up. We take a little break in the summertime because um, you all aren't around, and um, so. So, but uh, if you check out that link prior, you can register for any of the other webinar series. So if you have a question during the presentation, I want to like to remind you that up in the um, very top center of your screen, if you mouse over it, a drop-down menu will come, and you can access the chat menu. Um, I'll be accepting um, chat questions during the presentation um, and, in, and direct them to our presenters. Um, I would um, also let you know that this is being recorded today, and we will be putting that up on the CyberWatch web website, and we'll send that um, link with our thank you email. Um, and, and that's what I want to let you know. There's a post-webinar email coming to you that should have the presentation and the, um, the, um, the record link to a recording in case you missed anything. So we have our facilitator and our panelists today who have a lot to share with you. I always let them introduce themselves so you get used to hearing their voice and get, and you get to stop in mind. So um, without further ado, I present to you Dr. Diana Bowie. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to be with you today to talk a little bit about conducting classroom-based research, the, the how, when, why, and what. Um, I am an associate professor at George Washington University, and I am also the director of research for the National Cyber Watch Center. And with me today, we have Dr. Susan Swayze. Good morning. So happy you guys to be here this morning with us. I appreciate uh, Dr. Burley's invitation to present this topic with her, and I also appreciate the tutelage with which the presentation came together. All right. And with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Today, our agenda um, goes through, as I said, the what, why, how of cyber-based, uh, classroom-based research within the context of cybersecurity education. And we'll end the presentation talking about uh, just some steps on where you can go from here. Just, just a reminder that Susan and I cannot see you, and we cannot see your hands raised in the chat window. So if you do have questions along the way, which we certainly encourage, please don't wait until the end. Just put something in the chat window, and Portia will uh, interrupt and, and will answer your questions uh, along the way during the presentation. 
And with that, let's get started. So I want to turn it over to Dr. Swayze. Susan, can you tell our audience what is classroom-based research? Classroom-based research is often referred to as um, action research. So as you know, action research or classroom-based research, it's research that you conduct pretty much daily. It's a process that you go through definitely each semester with the courses that you're teaching. Um, you start with what do I teach, what should I be teaching, and then how do I teach it, uh, what is most, most effective, and then what are the outcomes. Um, that cycle that you use on a routine basis is the same cycle that you would use in a classroom-based research process. So if we're thinking about that cycle and we're thinking about how we go about our processes whenever we're teaching a course, can you step us through how this fits in? Yes. So first you would design the study. You would plan to implement it. I mean, sorry, you design your course. You make a plan to implement the course. You teach it. And then you evaluate how it all went. Um, part of that evaluation is a self-reflection. So how did I do? And also your perceptions, how do the students do? Sometimes you involve your colleagues in that process. Um, then there's a revision process, and then an implementation, a new course emerges. This is a cycle that you use, we use consistently and constantly. The question is, how does this classroom-based research transcend from something that is localized into something that is disseminated to others so we can share our um, best practices? So if I pick up on that word localized and think about the way that we, we're looking at this instructor teaching cycle where evaluation is at the end of our teaching and it's really, really structured so that it's set apart from our teaching, how does classroom-based research differ from that? Well, there's two pieces. So first, the evaluation is actually an ongoing process. Uh, many of us include in our courses a mid-course moment where the students reflect and we reflect in terms of how the, the, the process is going. Um, when we look at this next slide, we see this cyclical process um, where classroom-based research is an ongoing component, it's an underlying process that we use as we go through the semester. So it's not just at one point in time. Okay. So as we're thinking about our research and how we can um, improve what we're doing, there are many different topics that we might consider. And so maybe you could talk us through each one of these basic areas, and, and we can talk about some very specific um, questions that might emerge within cybersecurity education. Sure. So it all begins with the context in which we're teaching, the school that in, in which we, we work, and the school um, forces such as um, finance, leadership, change, um, and then we move to the instructor, and that is how we teach in our pedagogy and our, our growth and also our process by which that we develop courses and what we choose to teach and how we choose to teach it. And then there's the student, how the student is learning best. Is it by application? Is it by um, online modules? How is that student learning best occurring? And then there's a the context, and that's where cyber-specific focus is so important. How do we teach an emerging topic? How do we catch a shooting star? And how best to do it just in time to get our people out there in the workforce to be able to put it into action? Okay. So within each of these topics, let's talk specifically about some questions that might be of relevance in cybersecurity education. As we think about that first topic, so we're looking very broadly at the school, the institution, where we sit and, and where the education is occurring. There are lots of different questions that we might try to explore, but here are a couple of examples. I know that one of the things that we're always thinking about in cybersecurity education is our hands-on components and our computing resources. And, and we're often thinking about how can we best acquire those resources, how can we sustain our laboratory equipment? So in the context of classroom-based research, rather than just thinking about this as an idea where you say, okay, I'm going to go out to industry and I'm just going to find money, you're actually thinking about it in a systematic way, perhaps comparing different methods of, of engaging with, with industry or with grant programs or, or other funding agencies. 
um, and, and really thinking systematically so that it's not just what worked this time, but it's how can we continue to, to um, explore ideas that make this kind of thing work. With regard to the idea of organizational leadership, and this is something that we're often fighting with our administration, because although we think cybersecurity education is the most important topic, um, other people at our universities or our colleges have other issues, whether, whether they're healthcare or other types of, of very important um, educational concerns. So one of the things that we might be able to explore is what are methods of securing administrative support for advancements and resources uh, so that we can develop our programs. Again, these are things that we think about all the time. They're strategies that we may use and we may hear some um, from one of our colleagues at another institution that they are using. But when we talk about doing this in the context of classroom-based research, we're actually talking about systematic investigations, things that allow us to, to understand what strategies work, what strategies don't work, when they work, and why they work. Is that, is that fair to say? Exactly. Okay. With regard to instructors and instruction, there are many different topics underneath this large umbrella that we might consider, and we've just put a three of them up here for us to, to talk about today. The first is within the context of faculty development. We often have conversations about how to uh, maintain skill sets within faculty members, how to keep those skill sets current, different types of faculty development programs, um, whether they're offered by, by individual institutions or by centers. Um, and the questions here would be, how can we look at these different faculty development programs within the context of different faculty members from different types of institutions and really be able to say something about how these different programs align with the different institutions or the different faculty members? One of the things that, that um, we often talk about with regard to our curriculum is integrating security across the curriculum. Many different workshops, in fact, we just had a workshop, an NSF-sponsored workshop here in D.C. just last month, and again, one of the findings in that workshop or one of the key, key questions was, how do I integrate security across the curriculum? What, what is the most effective way of integrating security across the curriculum? And looking at the different models that individuals have put forth, whether they're in very basic courses like CS0 or CS1, or we're looking more advanced, what is the right approach? Again, I hope that these questions are res resonating with some of the, the members of the audience because these are questions that we're thinking about all the time, that we're exploring, that we are um, gathering data just perhaps informally. And what we're suggesting is that we can actually do a more systematic investigation of how to implement curricular innovation, how to implement faculty development or hands-on skill or what have you so that we can replicate and get some, um, some scale to our innovation. Uh, a sample question that you might explore with regard to the hands-on skill set, what is the appropriate balance? How do we figure out when we're trying to develop specific skill sets, how do we explore and understand the balance between hands-on activities and classroom-based activities such that we are reaching the optimal um, pace of skill development. And does that differ for developing different types of skills? Does it differ for developing skills among different groups of students? This is certainly something where you were, we're talking about and, in fact, coming up on the first or the first national conference for women in cybersecurity, and we're often talking about how can we get more young women in our classrooms and, in, and involved in the profession. There, it may be the case that there are different ways to reach students uh, who are female versus male and different balances that we can achieve in the skill sets to encourage 
that diversity. But we don't know. And anecdotal evidence, although it may tell us something about what happened in that one course, it doesn't tell us how we can leverage what we've learned and move it across multiple courses or multiple institutions. With regard to student learning, this is where we begin to really talk about, again, systematic investigation of how well the students learn the concepts that we were trying to teach. So when we talk about assessment, and probably this is the most closest when we think about our kind of the original evaluation efforts, often when we're talking about that original teaching cycle and we're thinking about evaluation at the end of the course, we're often viewing evaluation of student learning at the end of the course. What we're suggesting here is that you don't have to wait until the end of the course you can actually incorporate the assessments of student learning across each of the different elements of the course, different components of the course. And if you can put together a plan at the beginning, you can use that to compare across exercises within the course. You can use it to compare across semesters. So you're teaching the same course each semester, but you have different students in that course. You're able to really get a sense of how well did this work and why did it work in the fall semester and maybe not so much in the spring semester. What was going on? How can we really understand the impact of different factors in order to really um, be able to, to uncover the nuanced um, learning and, and in, impacts of learning or on learning for our students? Just want to remind you, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to jump in or raise your hand so that Portia can, can jump in as we go through these. Um, and if not, we'll just keep going forward. With regard to context, and this is really something that we tend to think about cybersecurity and the context of cybersecurity education as, as very unique. Um, we often talk about the characteristics of the field, that it's fast-paced, that there, that there is um, not a, a very large core body of knowledge, certainly not a core body that stays uh, static. And there's some debate over how much of that core body of knowledge is stable. Nevertheless, we do talk about the field as a very unique field. But the reality is that we could unbundle those characteristics and really think critically about other disciplines that might have similar characteristics to cybersecurity and look at the learning um, methods that have been successfully applied and used in those other disciplines. And we can think very critically about how those methods might translate into the cybersecurity classroom. So we might ask questions very specifically rather than taking for granted that, that the field is different, that the educational context is different, we could ask the question, how does the cybersecurity classroom differ from other computing disciplines? If we do that, then we're able to say, to ask questions of implications for applying other teaching methods. Um, I think often about methods that have been successful in computer science or even in, in chemistry or biology, other scientific disciplines, things like PLTL, peer-led teaching and learning, which has been shown to be very successful in the chemistry classroom, in the chemistry undergraduate classroom, where you have students, so you have peers, who are taking the lead in those classroom activities and using those students to lead the, the learning of their peers. Taking something like PLTL that has been shown to be highly successful in other disciplines and applying that method to the cybersecurity classroom might be something that would allow us to really see how different this environment is and what other methods can we use to advance the learning process in the cybersecurity classroom. Another question that often comes up 
is about the relationship between academia and industry and how we can maintain the currency of our curriculum. But rather than simply working as individual institutions or individual faculty members with members of industry and simply using what we learn to augment what we're doing in our individual classrooms, if we can think more broadly or more systematically about those interactions, in a way that allows us to create lessons learned, models for relationships between industry and academia that would help to inform others, we're able to advance not just what we're doing in our classroom, but what's happening across the country in cybersecurity classrooms. So those are all examples of different research topics that we could look at underneath each of those four umbrellas. There are many, many, many more examples, um, but what we wanted to do was just to give you a flavor and a sense of some of the questions that you might ask, because when you think about it, and, and hopefully when you listen to the, that discussion, you would find that many of these questions are questions that you're already asking, that you're already not just asking, but you're already really collecting data on, perhaps just not in the formal way that would allow you to um, to share it more broadly. So, Susan, Portia, were you going to jump in? No. Um, but, no. Okay. Just want to remind everyone that I'm I'm in chat, and um, and I'm and if you have a question, please please ask it. Okay. So then why don't we go on to, so we've talked about lots of different topics, but, and, and we've tried to say, yes, you're doing this anyway, but, but why don't we talk a little bit more about why it's worth conducting classroom-based research? So when you conduct classroom-based research, you're going from local wins, so your personal wins with your classroom with the changes that you've made with the effectiveness, to something that actually can be shared, so like shareable evidence something that can be transferred. And by engaging in the classroom-based research, you're actually participating in a larger conversation. And there are outlets for that conversation, such as conferences, um, communities of practice. Um, but going from these localized action research-based projects and then looking a little bit broader in terms of writing it up or presenting it, you're actually going into a larger larger focus. So classroom-based research, of course, is beneficial for improving your own teaching to increase the effectiveness of the course itself and your students' learning, um, and also to enhance your and your students' enthusiasm when something is going great, it's like multiplied. Um, but also you're able to replicate your innovations to the classrooms of others, and it's a cyclical, reciprocal relationship where their innovations can also serve you as well. So you're building models to scale up. And as we go forward, we have oh, – I almost skipped ahead. I'm sorry. So in regards to the CBR cycle, you select a topic, design your study, which would include a research question, methodology, timeline. Um, and specifically there, as we have mentioned, if you think about evaluation, you have formative and evaluative summits um, – formative and summative evaluations. So if you think about a course evaluation as a summative evaluation, an end of course or end of project evaluation, the formative evaluation piece is impactful as well. So as Dr. Burley mentioned, evaluating each module, evaluating each component, seeing what, what works well and with whom. Um, this timeline can help with that conversation. So do we want to have mid-course assessments, module-based assessments, but it's great to plan it out early and to sketch it out so that as you're going along, you have a, a guide. Then you conduct your study, analyze your data, act on your findings, share your research. Now, analyzing your data is one of those areas where people can feel a little bit underpowered. But there are resources out there. There are software packages. Um, maybe in a community of practice, you could can build, build a... Um, repository of individuals who can help with that analysis. Maybe there's an external entity that will help you with your analysis. But don't let the analysis piece of it scare you. There are folks who do just that. But the design and the conduct 
That's yours. It's your classroom. So that's the piece that is for you, about you, and run by you. And don't let the analysis bother you because that, that other people can handle. But this piece of it, the creative piece, so what needs to happen, that comes from, from yourself, from your classroom. And speaking of people who can help you, the National Fiber Watch Center can help you not just with the analysis phase, but with each of the phases in the classroom-based research cycle. With regard to selecting a topic, we can help you with idea generation. And when I say we, I mean not just me as the director of research, but all of us together collectively as members of the National Cyber Watch Center, as principals within the center, one of the things that we are going to do at the end of this webinar is create and, and lead you to a Google Plus circle where we can continue to have this dialogue. Uh, and so as we are thinking about different ideas or as you are thinking about different ideas and things that you want to explore in your classrooms, we can help you by giving you guidance to prior work. Perhaps you're interested in how competitions uh, influence the learning of your students or link back to the topics that you are doing, that you are um, teaching in your classroom. And you don't know whether there has been any research that's been conducted on that or even where to begin looking for it. So you could come to us at, at the National Cyber Watch Center and we could give you guidance to articles that have been written, studies that have been conducted. We've actually conducted some studies on that topic, uh, conference presentations, those kinds of things, just so that you can begin to get a sense of on this particular topic, on this particular question that I have about my classroom, here are what other people have explored with, with regard to that question. We can also help you find project partners so that if you're interested in how your method, you found success, you say you've done it several times, several semesters in a row, and you want to know how the innovation that you have successfully implemented at your institution might translate to another institution. We can help you find project partners. We can reach out across our network of members uh, and participating institutions and raise the flag to say, hey, someone in our network is interested in studying this topic. Are there any individuals out there who might want to collaborate? We can help you find resources, whether those resources are um, monetary resources, as in, is this something that the National Science Foundation or DHS or an industry group might be interested in providing some, some support for? Are there calls for proposals that are around that, that might be related to the topic that we're interested in studying? We can certainly help uh, guide you toward those resources. We can also provide support for the study, and so this is when Dr. Swayze was talking about analyzing research and the fact that there are packages, software packages out there. Yes, there are software packages, but there's also um, individuals who do this uh, for a living, and one of those individuals is sitting right here to my left, and she is able to help walk people through the design the development of, of research instruments, the analysis of data, so that you're not going it alone and you're not being, you're not uh, moving forward in a way that, that you just don't have time uh, to do. And then we can also help you find places to share your research because a big part of this, I mean, each one of these pieces of the pie are critical, but a big part of of conducting classroom-based research and of the value, the why, is to share it with others, to take what you've done and to say, I have systematically investigated this particular innovation. Here's how it worked. Here's what worked. Here's what didn't. But to share that with others so that you can begin to grow the, the, the network, you can achieve some scale, you can create some synergy, develop partnerships and relationships and just raise the dialogue and move it away from local success to national discussion. And so in that vein and thinking about all of these different ways that, that the National Cyber Watch Center can help you with your classroom-based research, 
we do want to to give you some insight into uh, or some avenue or venue, I guess, to continue this dialogue. And so we have created a National Cyber Web Center Classroom-Based Research Google Plus community um, where we will be able to continue the dialogue with you. You can continue the, the discussion with us as, as the presenters. Um, you can find collaborators, post information about the things that you're already doing. We will also include links to resources, and, and I'll have Dr. Swayze tell you a little bit about the resources that we have on the screen, just as some examples of, of what kinds of resources are available and what you can use them to do. Right. Well, a great resource is this Angelo and Crust. It's a text or a workbook, classroom assessment techniques. Um, it is definitely a step-by-step, -step, very thorough guide um, in terms of building your assessment capabilities. Um, for your classroom. Uh, the next two books, action research books, um, they are very user friendly as well. Um, and they talk about how to, but more in a general way. So the classroom assessment techniques book is more of a, a toolkit. It's a step by step guide. Whereas the other two kind of introduces folks more to what types of questions, types of possibilities. So there's that a different pitch, a different level. Um, but they all will help with the conversation about why I conduct classroom-based or action research. Okay, thank you. In addition to the Google Plus community, you certainly can reach out to us as individuals and send us email, and, and uh, we can begin the dialogue or continue the dialogue that way. But we also want to alert you to two current opportunities to share your research, whether it's research in progress, completed research, or just the very beginnings of, of a kernel of an idea about classroom-based research. So the first is our Community College Cyber Summit, 3CS. This summit is sponsored by the National Cyber Watch Center. And one of the things that we will be doing at the, the summit is to have a discussion, to continue the discussion about conducting classroom-based research. That discussion can be as broad or as specific as you as the, the individuals who would participate in the discussion would want it to be. So we can, we can talk about different ways to, to generate ideas and to perhaps uh, access resources that might help to, to guide us in a particular way. We can have a broad discussion about that. We can also have a more Focus discussion specifically on different methodologies, different ways for collecting data with your students that don't burden them, for example. Um, so you might be concerned, and I know that this is something that, that often comes up, and I'll ask Susan to, to address it, but one of the things that often comes up is, hey, I'd love to, to do this. I'd love to collect data from my students, but the reality is that my students have a lot of work to do. And it's challenging enough to get them to fill out the evaluations at the end of the semester. What are some different methods that I can use to get them to participate in additional data collection that would fall under this umbrella? And so we can certainly have a discussion like that at the summit, but maybe Susan can give you some ideas on that right now. Yeah. It's the idea of making your students participants in the research, not just as subjects, something that's happening to them, but something that they actually can contribute to as a, a, almost as a co-researcher. Researcher. So putting in your syllabus a statement that throughout the semester we will have um, assessment or feedback loops and you're expected to participate in them as part of your um, class participation points and that way students know that it's coming. But also after you do a mid-course um, evaluation or a module-based evaluation, to feed back to the students immediately so that they know as a group this is what we found and actually they're more of a participant more than a subject. And that way they're actually part of the conversation. And I think too, your students are typically, you know, close typically close to your age. They're adults, so they're not necessarily peers, but they kind of could be colleagues. Um, and I do feel that adult students have a lot to say in terms of their own learning. So feeling that they're part of that learning actually can increase their um, enjoyment in the course that they're currently in because they're part of the process. So that slide that we shared, the one that talked about why, why conduct 
classroom-based research is not just a why for you, it's also a why for your students. And so as you're thinking about, well, conducting classroom-based research is going to help me advance my, um, my ability to instruct and, and my effectiveness as an instructor and my excitement about the course, which is something that faculty members who conduct classroom-based research often talk about. This actually enhanced my enthusiasm and it made me a better, uh, a better teacher. Those two things also apply to your students because it increases their ability to learn, it enhances their ability to learn, but it also creates a larger excitement. You know, students often want to feel, as, as, as Susan said, participants, but they feel like, you know, we're an integral part of this. It's not an instructor-student uh, instructor relationship. It's co-creators of knowledge, and we are in this together. And so it does help to to increase their excitement and enthusiasm for for the material and for exploring more and, and probing and asking more questions. And really, when we think about the characteristics that we want in our students and that we want to foster in our students, we often talk about wanting to foster in them a curiosity and an ability to continue to push and probe and, and ask questions about what they're doing and what is happening in their environment. And, and this is a way to do that within the classroom and share the results with the larger body. And so it really becomes a win-win-win, a win for you, a win for your students, and a win for the larger community. So those are the kinds of discussions that we can engage in um, when we are at the Community College Summit in July and certainly in our Google Plus circle. The other opportunity that is currently available to you to share your research is the five-minute virtual science fair. And this science fair is a project of a faculty member here at George Washington in the School of Education. Uh, and he has created the We Share Science website where you can go in and create a video abstract, short video abstract, so less than five minutes, a video abstract of your work. Your research can be completed research, or it could be research that is in progress. And in, in progress could be anywhere from you have an idea, something that you think is very important or something that, that people would be interested in knowing about, or you have begun collecting data, you haven't analyzed it yet, but you have designed a study and you want to tell the world about this study because you believe that it will be that impactful. The video can be any format, and if you go to the, to the uh, We Share Science website, you'll see videos that are everything from a PowerPoint presentation with uh, an audio recording over top of it to actually watching someone, uh, you know, where the camera is on them. So the video abstract can be any way that you, you want it to be. And there are, and in fact, I just got an email from um, Dr. Watkins this morning that said that the poster is now wrong because it's competes for over $11,000 in prizes. Um, the National Cyber Watch Center has special prizes that they have contributed to the competition. Um, that include some cash prizes, uh, conference travel support. We are, in fact, offering uh, $500 in travel support for you to attend the Community College Cyber Summit. Uh, mentoring by national cybersecurity leaders. We have um, in our advisory board and in our network, we have access to some of the top leaders in the federal government and in industry who have agreed to have uh, discussions, mentoring discussions with you, or with the winners, uh, on anything related to their cybersecurity research, anything from how their research impacts practice, what's happening in the government or in industry, how to make relationships, stronger relationships with industry to advance what you're doing in the classroom. Uh, and we also have... Um, from the National Cyber Watch Center offered a, a free seat in any of the professional development classes that uh, Cyber Watch is involved with. The competition is open now, and it's open to students at any level and faculty members. So anyone is able to compete. 
The competition is open now through June 1st. Uh, you can get more information on the competition at that website. This, uh, when this presentation is posted, the uh, poster is also a hot link, so if you click on it, it'll take you directly to the website. But this is an opportunity for for us to share our research with the world to uh, gain some excitement and momentum behind conducting classroom-based research uh, specifically or any kind of research. This competition is not uh, limited to classroom-based research, but certainly if that's the kind of work you're doing, it would be um, great for you to, to uh, contribute it and to compete. I will say that the competition, the judging for the competition, is one of um, community judging. So it is Facebook likes and I think tweets or retweets. There is not as a small panel, but this is those who are competing can share this information and, uh, with their networks and encourage people to go on because the purpose is to get as many people involved, engaged, and excited about cybersecurity research as we can. And so we want to get people going to the site, watching the videos, because it's not, and I, the idea is not to dumb down the research. The idea is to provide just a clip, just a small tidbit, so that people will get excited, contact you, continue the discussion, and continue to, to move our research forward so that we can really make a significant impact on the way that we're educating our next generation of cybersecurity professionals. And so with that, we will open it up to questions. We can go back and talk specifically about topics. We can talk about the process for conducting classroom-based research, opportunities for sharing, or, or any other questions that you might have. So, so let me jump in. Um, uh, I have to say that you had me absolutely paralyzed with, um, with interest. Um, there, I have a question from the group, but before I, I move on to the question, I want to say that um, you're, you gave me the perfect segue when you said um, that we're going to continue the discussion. Um, uh, while we were presenting, and I think Dr. Burley may have read my mind when she asked me if I had a question, I almost let the cat out of the bag. But I have sent an invitation to you all to the Google Plus community. Um, it should be in your mailbox, and um, you should be able to click on there and join the discussion about classroom-based research um, in the Google um, Plus community. Um, this is this is a great place for you to post the kind of work that you're doing to see if you can drum up interest. Um, it's a great place to say that you're struggling and having trouble, uh, from, you know, um, with the research design. Um, uh, and you can click notifications on, so when anyone posts this community, it will jump right into your email box. So um, I just wanted to let everybody know that um, that there's an invitation in their box and that um, that we were sincere in saying that we want to um, extend this discussion beyond today. Um, one of the things that um, occurred to me while you were presenting, which was fabulous, you gave me such great ideas in terms of topics and um, and exactly what is classroom-based research and um, and um, and why I would want to do it. But we have a good question about the how. And I think um, that, that it would be real, and the question is specifically about are there any approaches recommended for conducting research in completely online programs? So this is a good point to discuss the how and discuss how it's part, how it can be integrated as part of your teaching and how, um, how it, it's pretty relatively seamless and painless. Yeah, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Dr. Swayze talk about that because she actually, um, teaches and conducts research in online courses every semester. So, Susan? And one of the great things about online courses is that um, sometimes students get a little bit concerned about feedback because of the anonymity aspect of it. And with online, um, there are so many options through whatever system you're using, whether it's Blackboard or another one, where you can actually do surveys within the um, technology itself where everything comes in anonymous, so you have no idea which student is saying what. But it is wonderful to have module-based assessments of learning um, course material, learning in an online environment, the development of the online learner, um, how students who've had previous online courses might do in a course versus others. 
um, I routinely, such as my online students, have um, assessments throughout the semester because it's actually a little bit, it's actually more conducive. Um, and as part of my syllabus, I think there will be frequent um, evaluations because I can't see you. I can't see the furrowed brow. So because of that distance, um, one of the ways I, I try to um, span the distance is to have these ongoing conversations that are somewhat offline. I've also had students um, do weekly blogs where they, on a weekly basis, told me how engaged they were with material or not, how they have developed as an online learner that week. Um, but I think putting it as an expectation in the syllabus is a gateway to um, first to let the students know ahead of time that it's expected of them, but also you're also starting the conversation, which is this is your this is our environment, and in order to improve it, I need to know how you're perceiving it on a weekly basis or a module based basis. You could also keep them engaged as well, right? So it it has that because you're you're always trying to make sure with your online courses, especially when they're asynchronous, mm -hmm. that the students don't just wait until you know the week before the end of the semester to get engaged, but doing this. It allows you to collect the data, but it also puts a built-in way for you to make sure that the students continue to be engaged consistently throughout the course of the semester. So I have a question about, a, it's kind of a technical question. Um, what are the implications of, of the Institutional Review Board, and what, what do I have to do there? So the short question, the short answer is every IRB at every institution has different rules, so you want to make sure that you're talking to your IRB first um, and foremost. But Susan, can you give some general guidance on that? Sure. So typically with de-identified data, so data that does not have a student or faculty member's name on it, um, most IRBs consider that to be exempt research, whereas if no one's name is directly attached, therefore you have a lower level of scrutiny from IRB, there's lower risk because you can typically not address any of the findings back directly to um, the student who's participating. Um, I would, before conducting a study, of course, consult your local IRB, your institutional IRB, um, but I would, in my planning, consider having as many of the evaluations or assessments um, as de-identified so not directly linked to a person. And this is something that's very important to think about. That's, that's part of the, the, the cycle. So that when you're doing your planning, and this is why it's important not to just wait until the end when you're doing evaluation, but you really want to consider that in the beginning because timing-wise, depending on your institution and how long their IRB process takes, you want to make sure that you have incorporated enough time to get the permissions that you need prior to the beginning of the semester so that you can actually begin. Um, there's also a lot of difference, not just with the identified data, but also with whether you are looking at performance, student performance data versus, um, you know, where you're actually connecting it to the grades that they received in the course versus not. So you just want to keep those things in mind as well. And also, if it's connected with your teaching, is this, um, there's a, there's a caveat there, if it's, isn't it? There, if there's a part, if it's a part of your teaching and assessment process, it's part of your, um, syllabus that's been, uh, in place for years and years and years, uh, because you can't, um, take the identities off for, for work that you have always assigned. You have to give them a grade. So can you address that a little bit? I think that it depends on, you know, certainly if there are components to your course that are part of your course uh, and that aren't separate, then it's covered under your syllabus. But, but the specific rules for what is considered to be research that's separate from your course or a course activity will vary by institution. So you really want to check with your the, your documents, and that's probably something that is in the basic IRB documents of your institution to give you at least a starting point for what they would consider to be research that needs their approval and, and what they do not. So that would be, I, I would go to them first and get their basic information, talk to them about the kinds of things that you're thinking about implementing, and 
get an assessment from them, and then once you do, then you can you can move forward and feel comfortable with the with the um, with your knowledge of the process and that you have appropriate permission. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, I think in the last few minutes, um, I'm going to offer one more last opportunity for our uh, listeners to um, ask a few more questions, um, and um, and then if there are no more questions. And um, I think Dr. Borley and Dr. Susie should give us a, a, a few last thoughts that perhaps will take away with us. And um, and then I will send my thanks. So, Dr. Borley. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's, again, it has been a pleasure to spend this hour with you to talk about how to conduct classroom-based research. I hope that we have given you some um, motivation and uh, some some tips on how to do it without increasing your workload too much. Um, but it's very important that you are able to share your work and your innovations with the larger community. We are a very um, close community, I think, in cybersecurity education, and we are constantly trying to move the ball forward, not just within our own classrooms, but for the nation. And, and conducting the research and sharing the research will allow us to do that. Again, you're not alone. We're here to help you here at the National Cyber Watch Center. You have um, our contact information, our direct contact information, as well as access to the Google Circle, and we would be more than happy to follow up with you to, today or six months from now if, if you decide that you want to conduct something, just keep a little note, and um, we look forward to hearing from you and, and to assisting you move your research agendas forward. Just a last-minute shout-out. It's pretty much you're taking what you're currently doing, your action-based research, what you're doing currently, and trying to give tips and tools to codify it so that you can present it or publish it so that your localized wins can become generalizable knowledge so that other people can learn from what you're doing, too. So it's just one more step, really, from what you're already doing to making it into a a package that can be presented to others. Right. Thank you. So on that, yeah, I was going to say on that note, I, I would like to thank both of our um, panelists and experts today, Dr. Willey and Dr. Stacey. Thank you for your time. Thank you for putting this together. Thank you for your expertise. This was um, a, um, an excellent presentation, and, I, and um, we have so much um, um, uh motivation now, at least I do, to, to move forward and and, um, and and I also would like to contribute. So I'll be on the Google community and I would like to thank all of our listeners. Um, thank you for coming in. Um, we look forward to um, to seeing you on future presentations. We also look forward to the discussion we'll have out offline, I think, Dr. Billy's offer, to um, to continue this discussion in, in, in six months from now and a year from now when you're ready um, we'll be we'll be here waiting for you. So we, I thank you all. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.